So we'll just give it a minute for the attendees to join us. Okay, so good afternoon everyone. My name is Louise Anninger and I'm part of Informa Connect. I'd like to welcome you to our session today. Thank you so much for joining us. We really hope that you are as excited as we are for today. We, we have an amazing panel who will be discussing how Nigeria can take advantage of the impending continental free trade zone in Africa and the opportunities that exist for the agricultural sector. Please do feel free to let us know your thoughts and your questions in the chat box or the Q&A box. If you face any technical issues at any point, please just rejoin the link. And I would now like to hand over to our moderator for today, which is Rode Alonsu. Thank you, Louise. Good afternoon for all of you who have joined us, or good morning, depending on where you are. It's a pleasure to have you uh, with us today and alongside the panel uh, that you see on the line to discuss the issue of the free trade continental uh, area for Africa. So the, the, the context for this, uh, I'm going to speak very briefly to some of the context and important highlights useful to keep in mind before we get into the body of the conversation. And then I'll hand over to the panelists who, by way of introducing themselves, will also speak to specific questions. And then after uh, 25 minutes of interactive conversation, we will then move into Q&A uh, to speak to some of the questions that you would have raised in the audience. And throughout this conversation, feel free to type into the Q&A box your questions as they come throughout the conversation. And so once we're done with the first part of, of um, the live discussion with the panel panelists, then I will be looking through the questions, using those questions to actually get the, the panel to react to the questions that you have. Uh, so on that note, I'm going to give just a few highlights for why we're talking about this and why is it important. So, Studies conducted to date have shown that the African continental free trade area stands to benefit the continent, um, Nigeria in particular. And a recent World Bank study specifically says that the opportunity for African countries is massive. It can bring about 20 million people out of extreme poverty and raise the incomes of another, an additional 68 million people who live on less than $5 per day. And further, facilitation measures and simplification of custom procedures that will emerge from the CFTA will drive $292 billion in potential income gains. And finally, the hope is that implementing the CFTA will help fast track some of the deep um, reforms necessary to enhance long-term growth in African countries. So with all of that, bringing that closer to Nigeria, and I know it's relevant for any other African country um, and in the region, but bringing it closer to Nigeria, we know that Nigeria has a 200 million size uh, local consumers market, which the agricultural sector is not yet able to feed. And as a matter of fact, we still rely on imports. The second thing to note again here is that Nigeria is also part of the ECOWAS community. And although it's, it's been already leading or spearheading exports to the region, there's still uh, important gains in the industry to take up the full size of the opportunity and drive exports in, within ECOWAS and then beyond ECOWAS. And finally, there is a need to also, while we know that there's a need to attend to the domestic market, the ongoing challenges with foreign exchange to put down the pressure on currency is 
actually pressuring towards thinking about diversification of export revenues for Nigeria from oil and take advantage of the exports uh, in, in other sectors, in particularly um, agriculture. So looking at all of these factors, it seems like there is a picture for opportunities. And more recently, a roundtable that Dalbo facilitated with key Nigerian agribusinesses and government stakeholders revealed that um, we know that this should probably benefit Nigeria, but not if we aren't able to take advantage of the opportunities that it presents. So on that note, uh, I will now turn to the panel and starting probably with uh, Uche, because I know you are in the logistics field and this topic strikes home for you. What are the changes that you're really seeing or that you hope will happen with the CFTA in your day-to-day -day work? And feel free to start by telling us a little bit more of what you do at Lori Systems, but we'd really love to hear the implications for your day-to-day -day work and the changes that you see that the CFTA is already bringing or have the potential to, to bring to your job. Hi everyone, um, happy to be here. My name is Uche Elboy. I'm the CEO of Lorry Systems. Lorry Systems is an e-logistics uh, platform. And what we do is we connect customers or cargo owners to transporters. So we're essentially bringing efficiency to the logistics space. And our goal really is to drive down the cost of moving goods across Africa. The, the, the concept was birthed after you know, several studies and we realized that logistics accounts for 75% of the cost of goods in some countries in Africa versus 6% in the US. Um, and so you can see the enormity of the inefficiencies that logistics causes. Uh, and so, I mean, to your question around what, what we're, how we're hoping that the CFTA will, will change our business, um, I think from, from our perspective, the biggest would be all of the harmonization around just clearing and customs and documentation um, around trade, import and export. Um, there's... I mean, the reasons why logistics cost uh, 75, is, accounts for 75% of the cost of goods is because of several reasons. The biggest one of which is infrastructure. Um, I believe we we'll, we'll lost your okay. change. Hello? You can carry on. Apologies, yeah, so moving a container for just about 18 kilometers, you're paying about 1,500. That's an equivalent of $85 per kilometer versus 10% in our neighboring country in Ghana, right? And this is because of several reasons, um, but just all of the multiplicity of documentation and regulations and everything that you need to do to get your goods either in or out of the country um, you finish with that in the ports, you get on the road, you have the police, you have the Navy, you have like, so we're really, we'll really be looking forward to the harmonization and just streamlining of that process that will come with the CFTA. Um, we do a lot of cross-border businesses. We're moving goods across 11 countries now and growing aggressively. Uh, we're doing a lot of cross-border in East Africa and we've been able to, through efficiencies around documentation and all of that, reduce the border crossing time from a, around seven days, which was the average when we started, to 48, hour, 48 hours and less. And we'll be happy to do that, you know, we'll really be looking forward to doing that in Nigeria and, and other countries. And I think that this creates that sort of discourse around how we can achieve that. I think, I think for us that would be the, one of the greatest um, um, advantages of this. Um, and, 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 you know, just delays alone, if you look at the, the asset utilization in Nigeria, um, it's about 7%. 
right? So that means that, you know, you're essentially paying for the remainder of 93% when you're transporting your goods. And this 7% is because trucks are idle on the road, either waiting to get in or waiting to get out. Uh, so that sort of efficiency and streamlining and harmonization, I think, will really drive a lot for our business and for just generally trade um, across the continent and in Nigeria. Thank you, Uche. Um, you set nicely the stage and you started speaking to one important item, which is the non-tariff barriers, right, that hinder the ability to trade between the within the continent, and it's critical that lifting or addressing those non-tariff barriers for sure will impact or will influence how much we can gain from this. So maybe I'll bring this to you, Kenneth. Um, and, and here, based on what Uche has already set up in, in this conversation, what do you see are the ways in which the non-tariff barriers that Uche spoke to mostly infrastructure, but I think beyond that, we hear, for example, um, with the, the current pandemic context, fertilizer imports in Nigeria to uh, support agriculture production is actually uh, being greatly affected. And there are a few other issues when you think about trading within the continent on agriculture, both for imports of critical goods that inform or helps the industry, but also to actually support those across the continent. What are the, the concrete changes that you think the non-tariff barriers, uh, around the non-tariff barriers could happen with the CFTA? Okay, um, th thank you very much for um, this um, opportunity. I'm Kenneth um, Oviagilu, um, an agribusiness specialist. And so basically one of the things that um, we feel from, from our end that um, non-tariff related um, policies and um, barriers can play a significant role is um, for us, we believe that one of the benefits of um, the CFTA is such that all countries will be able to benefit from their various competences. Um, either from a production end, um, and typically for a country like Nigeria, we're super deficient in a couple of things. Um, we, we can see, for example, the issues around um, fertilizer importation. Um, the fertilizer blending companies in Nigeria don't even have enough um, inputs to be able to, to manufacture fertilizers required for smallholder farmers. Um, we see issues around um, policies, um, that kind of do not work in tandem with what is required. I think one of the things that would um, the CFTA would be bringing to the table would be such that if all countries, especially with Nigeria, is able to harmonize in terms of what are the areas in which um, Nigeria can benefit from um, an excessive production of certain inputs for agriculture, where we're able to benefit without um, imposing um, lots of tariffs or creating um, limitations for the importation of this um, raw material. I think it will go a long way. Um, but basically, at the end of the day, it comes down to what levels of um, the governments between both um, um, countries and um, within the system must be able to have um, concrete plans to ensure that these non-tariff um, uh, principles or policies do not in any way um, affect the, the local um, activities in, in the various countries as they are. Um, one of our biggest um, challenge, and I'm sure Mr. Ijewe would, would uh, probably explore more on this, is Nigeria is heavily dependent on importation for um, lots of things. Um, how do we ensure that in creating um, a stage that allows for cooperation within um, the continent, um, we are not also at the receiving end? And how do we ensure that um, where we are basically going to be on, on the um, import side of things. How do we protect the systems in-house to ensure that we are also able to benefit from, from, this, um, from, from this policy as a whole? So um, nothing specific. It's more around how do we harmonize and ensure that um, every of these policies are able to, able to enjoy these benefits, both as um, an importing nation and also as an exporting nation. 
Right. Um, great, Kenneth. Uh, I, I think that you, <laughs> uh, you ended on a question which is important to address. In our, and maybe we can also, uh, I'll probably park that for when we get into the Q&A stage in terms of what are the concrete ways in which we can change those policies. And right now, I'd like to hear from you, uh, Wumi, from your work with the Global Share Alliance. What is the Im concrete impact that you're seeing the CFTA having on the farmers that you serve, uh, all the businesses that you serve? Will be useful to understand that impact perspective on the business side. Well, thank you so much, Rhodes. Um, I want to say a quick uh, welcome to everybody that's uh, participating on this call today. Um, and also thanks for inviting the Global Shea Alliance to come share our thoughts um, on the impact of uh, CFTA on the Shea sector. By way of introduction, my name is Wumi. Um, I am the Deputy Managing Director of the Global Shea Alliance. The Alliance is a 560 member-based alliance um, across 35 countries. And our overall goal is to ensure uh, three things, which is um, the promotion, global utilization of Shea being promoted across the globe. Um, in addition to that, ensure that we're harmonizing standards, uh, particularly quality standards, and we're doing this and achieving all of this in a very sustainable way. So that's really the three-pronged approach or the strategies that the Alliance have. When it comes to CFTA, um, it is indeed um, a great opportunity for us, um, for the agricultural sector in general, but also specifically for Shea. Um, to answer the question, you need to understand how Shea is being utilized currently. So, on a global scale, Shea is mainly used as what we call a CBE, a cocoa butter equivalent. Um, and a lot of that, while about 50% of what's harvested is consumed locally, um, another 50% is exported out of the, out of the Shea producing regions. Um, a lot of what's exported is, is going to places like Europe, it's going to China and other um, Asian countries. Um, and you don't often see that in intra-Africa trade. So when we talk about promoting the utilization of Shea, it is one, a very healthy oil that could also compete with any other kind of oil that's been imported into the, into the Sub-Sahara Africa, even Africa at large at this point. So that is one of the biggest opportunity is this new market that we have currently not tapped into. Um, being able to access that market. In your opening remarks, I think you mentioned that we're looking at about 1.2 billion people here. So for, for the share industry, it's looking at the potential of creating an African market for share um, outside of what it's currently traditionally used for. So that, that's one of the greatest opportunity that we see um, the CFTA bring in. in. In addition to that, as some of the panelists have as also mentioned, is the, is the fact that removal of some of this um, non-tariff um, barriers that are creating inefficiencies also um, create more incentives. One of the things that we've been talking about is um, the ability to actually do a lot more value addition on the continent with Shea, as opposed to importing raw materials out for production. A lot of that um, value addition that we're seeking to, to achieve is being, um, is being delayed for very obvious reasons. So we're talking about um, poor infrastructure, we're talking about inefficient road networks, we're talking about lack of capital, we're talking about um, uh, things like even the, the service that we need and the technical know-how that we may need to import from other, other, other locations. So removing some of these non-tariff barriers would also help us really scale at a, at a, at a greater space to, to where we want to see shade go. Um, we've seen growth in the sector for, for the last 20 years. We've recorded about 600% in um, an increase in demand for shade globally and we're estimating another 50% over the next five years. So that kind of just shows you what that potential is. And now if we translate that to the continent where we're, asked, we're creating new market, an African market for Shea, we're removing non-trade barriers, um, non-tariff barriers for Shea. Mm -hmm. What happens is that a lot of that benefit then trick, trickles down to the, to the smallholder farmers. Um, when you think, look at Shea at the base of the supply chain, you have about 16 million women that could actually benefit from that. So you're looking at potential um, opportunities to increase their income and possibly create more food security in the region and also really lift them out of that poverty line. 
Thank you, Umi. Um, I hear from you that the, the impasse could be tremendous on farmers, on, on um, businesses in the region, and because it stands to increase trade, intra-trade regionally, and at least advance some of the objectives that you have at the share lines. Uh, I think a question derails from that, um, and I will direct that to uh, Emmanuel. Uh, and perhaps before doing that, based on a question in the thread, useful to just remind again the topic that we're speaking to, which is um, the CFTA stands for Continental Free Trade Area um, and involves the fact that across the continent, it will be easier to take goods from a country X to another country whether we are within the same economic communities at the moment or not. And so I just want to make that reminder quickly. And then I'm coming to you, Emmanuel, with the question that um, if we see that this is going to actually, it stands to benefit businesses and, and trickle down to farmers. Uh, and you might tell me if you agree or, or not agree, for sure. But the, the element that comes with it is that we know that free trade agreements generally create winners and losers. And it, it's based really on competition and value chain complexity. And we know that there are traditionally in agriculture, there has been some sectors that have been quite protected by tariff barriers, such as poultry, rice in Nigeria to protect the local market. How do you see, what is the implication that you see? And again, from across the businesses that you represent, uh, what do you see as the implication of the CFTA implementation on agricultural products that have been previously protected by tariff barriers? And in, in other words, do, is Nigeria ready to embrace the CFTA? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for bringing for give me the opportunity of participating in this discussion. Um, the, what, I represent Nigeria Agribusiness Group from the Vice President. We, we are set up by Dr. Adishin or Kim Adishin or when he was Minister of Agriculture. The reason why he set this body up was because he discovered that the agricultural landscape was checkered. They all operated in silos. The Cassava Grow Association worked for their own particular interests, even ignoring the interests of Cassava Processors Association. The, the, the cocoa farmers were, had nothing to do with the uh, plantain farmers, all these kinds of situations. And he felt that Nigeria would not benefit from this. So there has to be an umbrella body that brings all these associations together so they can have an advocacy group that can let them talk to government. Government had been at the command, commanding height of business in Nigeria, including agriculture. And what they have done, the other issue he brought up is what, they have, what government has always done is to deal with agriculture from the supply side rather than the demand side. Demand side is more economic. Demand side is likely to make the system a lot more efficient. But because government has always been in it and they were not really businessmen, they have created a situation that made it difficult for Nigeria's agriculture to even thrive. It became a, a, situa a place where old people and those who have accepted poverty as a way of life can operate. But he reversed all this. If before seven years ago, this uh, Africa trade, trade zone came, came up, I will, I will carry placard on the streets of Lagos and Abuja that we must not join because we were absolutely and totally not ready for anything outside Nigeria because we are incapable of competing. But the past five or six years has created a great number of opportunities for the agricultural space. The, the, you ask a direct question, uh, are we ready? The answer is we are not fully ready, but we shall never be fully ready unless we are challenged. And what are the things that need to be done? Like I said, uh, the, I wear a number of caps. One of them is the advocacy world, which is bringing me to this platform. 
I'm enjoying what I'm listening. I listen to the lady about the she, I listen to the lady about the logistics and so on. Those are very exciting things that I'm picking up and I've been, I've been writing since I've gone to the third page of my note. I'm learning from what is being said. I would say categorically that the opportunities are enormous, but we have a number of challenges within our country. You went on and you spoke about the protection of some of the Nigerian um, products. You spoke about uh, poultry and so on. Let's tell each other the truth. They were protected on paper. In anything you try to protect, all you do is to encourage um, um, what is a background business or, you, uh, or uh, invisible business, which is a smuggling issue. The poultry industry has been challenged very badly by the smuggling that comes in. A large number comes in. So there's no particular uh, product that has been protected by government effectively. Even rice, we all know what's happening. So for me, I believe that um, the African free trade uh, opportunity is a big one because I know that Nigerians are capable of really rising up locations where the going gets hard. Now, what I would want to say here is it's important that every part of the economy, every part of the agricultural space need to work with each other. The entire value chain has to be, has to be looked at. Uh, when uh, uh, it, uh, the lady was talking about logistics. I was very excited. That is a major, major, major issue because I've been in it, involved in this for a very long time. But they need also to be granular, come to the level, not just from the level of moving it from one city to the other, or one country to the other, but come to the level where the various, given the peculiar situation of Nigeria agricultural space, most of our farmers are small time farmers. The other thing we need to do here, and that's where Kenneth is going to come in, is that the efficiency in aggregation from all these will make it a lot better, easier for us. Nigeria certainly cannot produce everything we want. We have to take the advantage, where we have competitive advantages, where we, should, we need to go for. But there is also a challenge here. The challenge is this. The rest of Africa is not sleeping. They see Nigeria as a big, huge, humongous market. They are aware of the inefficiencies we have in the system. But I also want to say that the majority of the countries in Africa are not better off in terms of inefficiency in their internal situation. So I am not worried about it. But this exposure of Nigeria to the rest of Africa is bound to be very positive for all of us because we are capable of learning. I mean, you could hear the way of this, these young ladies when they were speaking and Ken, you could see these ones when they stand up because these are the assets of the country, the people, the brain, and the determination to succeed. So that's what we are carrying forward. This is not a theoretical thing, it's a practical thing, and it shows that the, all of them are their hands on. These are the things that I am so confident about that the Africa, they should be afraid of us rather than thinking that Nigeria will be a dumping ground. I'm very much in favor of the African uh, trade zone. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, do you mind if I also chip in one or two things here? Yes, please get that. <laughs> okay. Um, so thank you so much, Mr. Iman and You know, it's always um, a privilege listening to um, my Oga, like you like to say it. You know, one of the things I'm, I'm very sure we've also talked about um, on several locations is the fact that you see this principle of induced innovation that um, would come about as a result of the CFTA, where if Nigeria, um, the principle simply states that um, if there is scarcity in one factor of production, right, innovation will take place to be able to optimize the use of that factor of production. Um, case in point, if um, the lands available in developed economies um, continue to remain limited, they would no longer build bungalows for them to live in. They'll begin to build high rises because they need to optimize the use of land. Um, in a case like Nigeria, if um, the, or in the case of um, countries like um, the US and Germany, when the cost of labor 
is very expensive, they would optimize on the use of machineries to be able to utilize resources properly, right? Um, if finance is not available, we would start um, innovating around how we're able to plug finance to the system. I think um, the CFTA is, is that um, boiling point for us as, as Nigerians as well. Um, if we don't, if we don't get it together, like Mr. Emmanuel Jerry said, um, it's it's not more about um, a challenge for Nigeria. I think Nigeria dwells or thrives more in all of these challenges. It's about um, it's not a paper policy. We've never been protected in the first place. There are areas um, in which we need to improve on. I think one of the best ways for us to get these started is to ensure that the policy frameworks um, that can allow us to even start are in place already. And then we would learn um, and ensure that um, Nigeria is not a dumping ground and um, the youth would also be able to rise up to the challenge to ensure that we're not just importing, but we're also pushing things of value out of the country. Um, excellent, uh, Kenneth and Emmanuel. It seems the answer is clear. Nigeria is ready for this. It will never be ready for it if we don't start. And the challenges ahead are things that we can take up. And so if I'll follow up with you, Kenneth, on that, it's to take advantage of this opportunity, it means that we're able to export and we're able to be competitive in a few sectors, right? And so my, my question is, are there some particular industries in which Nigeria should specialize itself and enhance its complexity and competitiveness if we want to get into those uh, markets outside of the country. Uh, what are those industries in which Nigeria stand to gain if we go towards more, more specialization in those? Okay, um, we know for a fact that um, because of the population um, of Nigeria, um, we have um, lots of um, produces and um, value chains that we thrive in. Um, case in point, um, like I tell everyone that cares to hear, Nigeria is currently the second largest producer of ginger in the world, right? And um, we represent about 16% of global production. Um, but in terms of the export market share, we, we are simply at, um, we are responsible for just 3.5% um, of the global market of, of, of exports. These are areas that Nigeria can specialize in as a major force in um, export um, potential commodities like this. Nigeria is the largest um, producer of yam in the world, right? Um, and but more than two thirds of the yams that we produce rot um, in, in the farmers' um, um, farms, right? Uh, for me, I, I believe that in the, er in the era of opening up um, the system for all African players to play as a single market, one of the things that we would um, likely start looking at would be areas of specialization and um, countries focusing on their areas of competence such that we're not duplicating efforts. If, um, and this is my opinion. If we are good in the production of certain commodities in um, large volumes and we have the capacity to be able to augment um, these volumes to um, the various countries within um, the CFTA. And I think that would be um, one of the welcome developments for, for um, a country like Nigeria. But yes, we know for a fact that there are several um, commodities that we have comparative advantages in. And um, we should be able to look at developing even deeper system that allows us to be able to um, get more benefits from, from, from those commodities. I know um, cassava is one of them, um, ginger is one of them, yams, um, we have an um, abundance supply of that. Um, sesame, we're one of the biggest producers in the world. So I think um, we can look inwards and um, determine what are those areas of comparative advantages and um, see how we're able to grow in that while we also open our systems to um, other countries that also have their comparative advantages in certain crops as well. Could I come in there? Except the ladies want to say something. Um, yeah, I, I was looking up to you, Emmanuel, actually. Yes. So please go ahead. I, 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 will, I, will, I would like to request that if when we are going to, when we really want, to, if we really want to go into, not if, before we go into this um, African free trade thing, um, signatory, 
signatures. Uh, because we're trying to get the number of signatures that need to go into it, but the number of people are, are trying to tail back on that. But nevertheless, we need to separate two things, the food and the business. What I mean by that is this. The food has to do with security. Things like tomato, rice, cassava, yam, beans, all these are very, very important to be really guarded against. But having done that, you now you dig deep on those and you discover that the yields from many of these in Nigeria is quite low compared to other countries of the world. The large quantity of yam we produce is done within an inefficient system where the farmer has to work three times as hard to achieve that goal. And on top of that, a lot of it is lost. Like can I pointed out? How do we get more, get more efficient in the processing and getting this yam and processing them? The other point is the food. The food are seasonal. There's a time in the year when tomato is selling for 700, uh, sorry, 5,000 uh, naira per basket. At another time, at 32 naira per basket. The system. Did we just lose Emmanuel? Um, yes, I, I think so. I mean, if I were to speak to what he, he's also trying to say, our systems are, uh, are largely um, almost very inefficient. It, it, um, if you look at the productivity levels, you see that the biggest challenges in agriculture evolves around four major areas. Um, low productivity, high post-harvest losses, access to finance is almost non-existent. And then the farmers, when they have gone through all of these three issues, have to go through multiple layers of intermediaries. So I think one of the, one of the um, issues that Mr. Jerry was also trying to point out um, was the issues around the efficiency of the system and how um, our farmers can cultivate on the same hectares of land, but in terms of productivity, would have case in point, some of our farmers have an average yield of 10 to 15 metric tons per hectare for cassava cultivated. But in other parts of, of, of Africa, like um, Zambia, like um, you know, um, other, or, or other parts of East Africa, Kenya, you see the yields are up um, to about 33 to 35 metric tons per hectare. You look at issues around um, um, milk yields from our, from our cows, from our cattle, right? We, we process um, about 0 0.5 liters to one liter every single day. Whereas in places like South Africa, places like um, Kenya, you know, where they have implemented some dairy development programs, you see that the yields are in excess of seven liters per day. You know, so I think um, one of the things that we need to look at would be the efficiency of our systems in ensuring that what we do know how to produce, we're able to increase the efficiency level, you know, that would help us in driving productivity. And that's, that's where we can also start from. So more interventions can go into these spaces. I don't know whether Mr. Jewelry is back on this call. Can I chime in while we wait for Ms. Thank you, Kenneth. Yeah. And me specifically, if you, as uh, you, you react to this, I'd love to hear as well how you balance this complexity, efficiency in some sectors right. with um, food security, right? We know that we have an internal market that needs to be fed. And at the same time, we want to go on to new markets outside of the uh, of the country, how do we balance this with? Right, so I, I think I, I echo a lot of um, some of the concerns that Kenneth um, raised as well, where he talked about the fact that Nigeria is like the largest, the second largest pr um, producer of ginger in the world, but yet our export is 3.5% of global, well, we contribute to 3.5% of global export. And I think that this is a cross commodity actually, um, Perhaps that there's some commodities that we perform better at than the others, but it's similar for Shea. Um, with Shea, for instance, you see Nigeria owning, in terms of the tree population, about half, just from a landscape perspective, there's, there's a competitive advantage there. 
but Nigeria only accounts for 10% of exports. And when you drill down into like, oh, why is this the case? You realize that a lot of what um, Kenneth has raised and Mr. Manuel has raised is what, what's affecting the shea sector as well. You're talking about um, uh, lack of uh, skills at the, at the farmer level um, to be able to either improve quality of shea that would attract um, um, off takers. You're talking about inefficiencies at the board. Um, I'll give an example. We have um, some of our members that actually invested in Nigeria. They came in ex excited, trying to like buy, uh, buy in a level of trans uh, transformed product, only to to go through all that um, all that work, that heavy undertaking at the family level. And then you get to the port and your stuff is stuck at, at the port for like two, three months and you're frustrated. Um, and, and no joke, they decided to pull out. So, and these are the things that are actually cost in Nigeria in the long run. But, but then when you talk about what the CFTA does, it, it also gives us that opportunity to do better and to learn from our, from our um, African partners. Um, in Canada, um, while he, when he was talking, he mentioned the fact that you could see better yields in Uganda, for instance. Um, one of the things that CFD allows you to do, particularly at the SME level, is import temporarily some of the service, some of the skilled knowledge that, that could be passed down to our own farmers, that could be passed down to our own SMEs. And it removes that a lot of that burden, a lot of that um, paperwork, for lack of better words, just that, that irritation you get out of trying to just put together the paperwork. It removes a lot of that hassle and provides our SMEs the opportunity to actually access the skills, the technical know-how that they need to be able to um, build the capacity, um, work with the smallholder farmers, even the, the micro um, enterprises as well. Um, but also, it, it, it's the public-private partnership angle as well. How do we bring in um, partners to be able to to invest in a lot of what we what we're trying to do here, and that's something that the GSA, that's something that we actually advocate for, is to be able to achieve a lot of these goals using public-private partnership model, um, where you you're able to split that responsibility um, with the government as well with the private sector, and find um, an angle that works for everyone. So. I, I kind of feel like while we talk about all the inefficiencies, we can also look to um, the CFTA um, to see what the potential benefits are. So we're talking about potentially moving from like 18% of intra-Africa trade to something like 50% by 2030 um, compared to where we are today. So that there's still very much positive opportunities that we could actually tap into. Um, this is absolutely great. Uh, like the like some of the insights I'm hearing uh, on on this conversation, um, Kenneth, me, and Emmanuel. I will. Thing on. Um, can you hear me? There's a lot of uh, poor network going on here. Um, can you hear me? Really? Yeah, I can hear you. Uche. Yeah. Just Did you want to come in on that question? Yeah, just to add two cents to your specific question around food security. Um, I think Kenneth mentioned two of the biggest leakages that we have in the value chain. One, one is obviously just productivity, where, Hello? Per, per the example, we are essentially, you can be producing three times more in, in Nigeria versus, you're producing three times less in Nigeria versus Zambia, and in some, in, in some other crops, it's as much as seven times or more. Right, so if we address that specific problem alone and you're able to achieve that level of productivity, whether it's because of the quality of the seeds or the inputs or whatever kind of financing or training is required, if you're able to achieve that level of productivity, you've automatically tripled your production, right? And so even if you're keeping two parts and exporting one part, you're still addressing the food security problem because you've essentially doubled the, the amount of, um, of, of the volume of production that you were producing before for your local consumption. That's just one. And then the second one is post-harvest losses. There's so many statistics around this and, I, and I'm sure Mr. Ejeri and Kenneth would know more, but some of the ones that I've, I've come across is that up to 
the, the, the amount of post harvest losses can still be total undernourished population in Africa, which is about 870 million people, right? So if we are able to plug that leakage, if you're able, if we're able to sort out processing, storage, um, transportation and logistics, right, which is where we come in. If you're able to sort out all of those pieces that lead to the post-harvest losses, you automatically essentially make available significant volume um, to the market, right? As, 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 as has been mentioned on this call, majority of the yams produced are, are destroyed or, or rot on the farms of these farmers. If those don't happen, then we wouldn't have a security problem. So I think that they're just bare fundamentals that um, both private sector and the government can work on to ensure that even just doing the minimum, we can increase volume with the same, we can increase the volume of production um, and not and, and have an issue of uh, security. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely uh, insightful, uh, Uche. What I'm taking away is that there's, there are three things that I take away so far. CFTA stands to actually benefit Nigeria if we take the right steps and actually by increasing our, by, this is forcing us to be more competitive. And by forcing us to be more competitive, we actually have trickled down benefits to other issues such as food security because suddenly we are forced to be more innovative and to be more efficient in our value chains. Um, and I, I really like that note. And maybe a final question before we open to the, uh, to the Q and A. And this is back for you, Uche. If you put on your venture capitalist cap here and think about the fact that in the audience today, we have many SMEs who are here thinking about what is that thing that I need to do to take advantage of the opportunities that come with the CFTA. What would be the advice that you would give to SMEs in the room today? So I think we, we sort of addressed a lot of them um, on this call. But the biggest one is essentially, as Jerry has mentioned, looking for um, looking at the, at the at the demand side, right? What are the most uh, what are the crops that we're most competitive at? What are the crops that have significant market demand um, in and out of, outside of Nigeria? And focusing on those. So once you've identified those, then going back to the value chain and thinking about where in that chain you want to play and how you can develop yourself to be essentially at, at, at world-class standard. Now, if we want to, if we want to um, export, uh, if we want to focus on the benefits of, 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 um, of ensuring that we can take advantage of these benefits, then we have to, again, our, our, our goods have to be competitive. They have to be at a certain level of quality. And so you need to, as a small and medium-sized business, you need to be focused on, even if it's a niche, you need to be focused on that level of quality. And, you, right, and this is what um, the CFTA does, does for us. I mean, I was listening to the, the lady that, um, <clears throat> the lady, one of the founders of, of, of uh, in Southern Africa, and essentially for some of those regions, uh, what the free trade agreements in their regions have allowed them to do is take advantage of a larger market. And that's essentially what we're trying to do here, right? So we need to really be thinking about what is that market volume because investors are looking at that uh, profitability and how do you get profitability? It's essentially by being able to sell, by increasing your revenue. And you can only do that if you have a massive market. So you need to, first of all, think about the market and then think about your product and make sure that you have a fit between the both of them. Of course, there's a role that, the, that we hope that the government will play, and I know that they're already playing. There's a lot of intervention in this space, um, but you know, we hope that there'll be continued intervention around just um, affordable. But, uh, 
essentially uh, for, for the space to essentially ensure allow people to, to Okay, the, the line is just breaking on your end. But I think we've heard the gist of your recommendations and suggestions to small businesses. Structure that is required. Um, some of these investments are obviously public Speaking of um, which I'm not sure if you're able to hear me. Space, which is mine. We would hope that the government will, um, you know, invest in it looks like the network is very, yeah. very quite bad. Can we get somebody else to speak? Okay, I think she's now on mute. And speaking of uh, increasing efficiencies to take advantage of the CFTA, I think technology is going to be one of those key things that we, we get ahead of for, for us to fully take advantage. Um, and what I take away from your intervention, which is very, very critical uh, advice to SMEs, starts from uh, looking Hello. for improving the quality, uh, quality of products that they're putting on the market. And that's one of the key yeah. wigs and ways that they get onto uh, concurring other markets on the continent. Um, very well taken, Uche. We lost you towards the end. There were issues with the connectivity, but we've well taken your point. So I think the, the next uh, thing would be um, Uche. Can you hear me now? Yes, but there's, uh, it's quite slow. I think there's a, there's a connectivity issue there. Um, but definitely, I think it's on is a point taking on our to do list to um, really, really address technology issues as we think about improving our efficiency for sure. And services, which is uh, linked to agriculture, and we haven't spoken about today, is also something critical. I'm looking to see if there are questions from uh, the participants. And while they come, uh, while questions come through, I will move on to um, a few other questions that I have and maybe another reflection as well. When I listen to you, Kenneth uh, and Emmanuel, I heard commodities. And I believe that from several work that we've done within Dalberg, looking at opportunities on the continent, Commodities have been one of the key, exporting commodities has been one of the key things that have put our countries at risk. And so the next stage will probably be moving across, uh, moving up the value chain to have more complex industries and more complex value chains. Uh, do, do you agree with that, Kenneth? And <laughs> feel free to disagree. I would love to hear if there was uh, a particular interest on commodities or it was just by your way of explaining the topic. Of course, I, I, I agree with you. Um, the fact that we have, we have played um, so much at the, um, at the lowest point of the value chain for so long. And uh, like you rightly said, exporting commodities has been our biggest problem. 
because um, case in point, you export raw cocoa, you import chocolate, right? And um, the prices come at about four or five X of um, the, the cost of the raw um, cocoa pot. Um, we export um, dried split ginger and then we import um, ginger beer or um, any other ginger based product. So I think it's, it's high time we also plug out those leakages within the system where um, we move one step ahead, you know, in the value chain. Let's, let's focus on adding value to, to what we do. It will earn, um, it will earn the, um, the entrepreneurs and the country um, so much more foreign exchange, um, exporting processed um, products as against exporting these commodities. Um, but then again, it comes down to the efficiency level you know, we, we don't just address um, these issues from, um, um, from theory, right? We address them from a point of uh, infrastructures required to be able to move from a production-based economy to a processing-based one. Are they in place? Um, case in point, what's, what's the cost of power when you want to um, process um, products from its raw state to a, even if it's a semi-processed form? What's the cost of power in, in this regard? Um, what's the cost of, um, like um, Uche rightly said, the cost of logistics moving from one point to the other. So it's, um, we can't, there's no straight jacket solution to all of this, but I, we definitely agree in principle that we must, um, um, exporting commodities and trading in commodities has been one of our biggest um, challenges. Um, it, it exposes us to um, a lot of these um, issues that we're facing right now, but we need to be able to also address um, how can we move from um, being just a production-based um, economy, exporting um, raw commodities to moving one step in, in, in the value chain. Um, that's excellent. Thank you, Kenneth. Um, and I will now go to our, um, our questions from the audience. And the first question comes from Tolu uh, Lokbe, and his question is, what will you advise to third party companies who want to come in to address some of the issues that you've identified in exporting processed and finished goods? I think that questions uh, will go well with, um, uh, with you, Uche, if the connectivity is back, because you are in the third party logistics supplier uh, angle and feel free to stay off video maybe and, and that may improve the the connectivity. Um, I, I hope this is better. Is this better? Yes, definitely. Okay, all right. Um, I think, I, I don't know if you heard my response to the earlier question about um, about uh, um, um, you know investment and how SME should think about how SMEs are looking to take advantage of this is a similar question which essentially analyzed the decision to participate in exportation um, of process and finishes. yeah so uh, again I, I'll, I'll repeat some of what I said earlier but again, it's really about looking at the market, be really doing a deep and uh, solid review of the market that you're targeting. Your target market, how big is that? Uh, the, the best thing to do is always to get offtake agreements. So ensure that you're able to get agreements from potential customers um, that will, that will offtake your product, uh, banks and finances like that. So once you have some sort of, um, once you have some sort of certainty on offtake, you, you may be able to raise, raise some funding that would enable you to actually put it back into the business and um, to essentially generate some of the, 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 processed, the processed and finished products that you need. Okay, um, uh, so that, that of course is key. So looking at the target market, 
advertising that and then trying to get as much um, of take agreement as possible. Now, the benefit of the CFCA. Uh, thank you, Che. Uh, I think we we heard uh, part of your response. I can hear you now, um, and we we heard your response around the need to find other third parties and and key uh, partners to as a, as an SME to take advantage of the CFTA, in particular banks and and logistics companies. I think because of the connectivity issue, uh, I'll go to Wumi for anything you want to add on, on that question. And again, to say the, the question again, it's uh, what would be your advice to third party companies uh, to come in to address some of the issues that we've raised in agriculture in terms of efficiency, post harvest losses and uh, um, and efficiency in the process to actually get goods across to other markets. What are the opportunities that you see for third party companies to come in? Well, so I, I think to answer the question and I would be a bit biased here because I'm also of the school of thought that Nigerians should be able to address their own issues themselves. Um, so that, that is actually first my opinion. Um, however, in terms of like third party partners coming in and bringing in some of that skill set that already exists, um, it's really looking for the right partnership. Um, how can you um, how can you identify the right um, local partner to work with? Um, and how do you um, work with someone that could share the risk as well? Um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of need for investment into the ag sector. Um, there's a lot of need to um, identify how we could do this efficiently. But yet again, there's certain challenges um, that discourages this type of investment from coming in. So when you look particularly at, um, and I'll keep using Chi as a reference point, some of the shape producing states, for instance, we're seeing um, a rise in insecurities in those areas. Um, and for certain investors, that's a concern. So, and that's a risk that they will want to share with a local partner. So how can a local partner um, proactively show the way that they would address um, such interruptions and ensure that it doesn't affect productivity or ensure that it doesn't um, really eat up the investment that's coming in. Um, so it really is identifying the right local partner, understanding the market as well. Um, I, I was speaking to someone yesterday who reminded me that there's a lot of investment that has come into Africa within the last 15 years. Um, a lot of intra-Africa investment actually. So uh, examples like M MTN, um, examples like ShopRite. So there have been investment within space, it's not new. Um, but yet again, is really, and, and this is something that CFDA does, it really opens um, investors um, to, to come into countries like Nigeria, other countries, and understanding more of the local context. Um, what exactly does um, uh, the ag sector need? Are we talking about climate smart agriculture? Are we talking about... Um, are we talking about like new technologies to reduce post harvest loss? Like what are those things and how do we build partnerships around it? Um, a lot of things that in the development space that I'm seeing coming up as well is, is the right type of investment. We're talking a lot about blended investments um, where donor organizations, for instance, want to be a private, a private partner match. It is no longer just um, here's a grant, um, go implement, but they really want to see how, how that, um, how that fund is being put into place, how that addresses other social issues like youth employment, how that creates more jobs and all of that stuff. So in order to attract that, you need to be able to understand what your investment investors are looking for and be able to show concretely how you contribute to some of those interest areas. Um, thank you, Umi. And then the, there's a question for specifically for you, Kenneth. You mentioned that Nigeria is one of the major producers of ginger. And can you advise on other African countries Nigeria can actually export its ginger to, both as raw material or 
ginger or, or finished products such as juice, powder, tea, etc. Okay, so um, generally um, the the market is is quite broad. Um, we know for a fact that um, a huge chunk of the, um, about ninety five percent of the ginger produced in Nigeria is exported out of the country, either as um, fresh ginger, dried split ginger, and in some very rare cases, ginger powder. Um, we know for a fact that the trade goes more towards the Middle East and then it flows to, to Europe and other parts of the world. Um, but we're beginning to see a reverse um, in, in the transactions happening of late. And I'll give you a case in point. We had um, a client that we were working with that would um, traditionally export um, dried split ginger to Dubai, right? Um, during the pandemic, um, there was a lot of congestion in um, the um, port of Jebel Ali in Dubai. And so um, the customers in Dubai decided to tell the uh, suppliers in Nigeria to move the products to um, a customer in South Africa. Now, automatically, that opened up an opportunity to ask certain questions. Why are we exporting um, stuff to Dubai that would end up in South Africa? Right. So um, it's, um, we started looking at the various other African countries that are heavy importers of, of um, ginger products. And um, we know that Morocco is, is topping the charts in, in Africa. They, they are responsible for 0.9% of the import numbers for ginger, be it um, raw ginger, dry split, or ginger powder. We know that Sudan represents about 0.4% of the ginger that is being imported um, globally as well. Uh, so globally, we're looking at um, a market of about um, $868 million worth of imports per time, you know, depending on the year you're looking at, we're looking at 2018, 2019. So um, other African countries that are very, very, um, they're good markets for the kind of products that we have, uh, Morocco, Sudan, um, Egypt, um, South Africa as well. So um, I hope that answers the question. It, you can export both the raw material or um, semi-finished products um, at the end of the day. The applications for ginger is um, medicinal, that to be used by pharmaceutical industries, um, food and beverage, of course. And um, yeah, so that's, so that's basically it. I hope I answered that question. Yeah, absolutely, Kenneth. And uh, I think for, uh, this is a concrete, um, <laughs> concrete elements like uh, Morocco is a concrete market for ginger and I like how concrete these questions got and uh, very happy if some of the SMEs take away from, from this panel today some markets to explore for specific uh, products. So we have a question from Janet uh, Ojo Olowoye and her question is, uh, I'll target this to you uh, Emmanuel, we have spoken of a lot of challenges, technology, logistics, access to finance, um, government ownership to prioritize agriculture deliberately. And we know that in some cases, government policies in some cases are drawbacks to agricultural production and effectiveness. But moving beyond the theoretical elements that we discussed today, what can be the practical things to do to be brought across of the government uh, of Nigeria for quick action. And <laughs> I think the element is really on quick action and making sure that we get the short-term gains of the FCTA. What are those things that we should completely put in front of the table for, for the government? Uh, thank you. Now, uh, I'm sorry I, I got caught off the last time, but here we are already uh, putting the various um, things in place. First, I'm very excited about the central bank's definite interest in agriculture and recognizing that agriculture is the future of Nigeria's economy. Number two, we are getting a policy coming from the head of state, giving priority to agriculture. What we have done first is to draw attention to the fact that Nigeria's future is not in oil, but in agriculture. That's beginning to have the, um, we're getting to reap dividends from that. But also, a number of things have also happened. Quite recently, I'll give you a quick, one of the statistics we presented to, <laughs> to the head of state that really upset him. 
was the fact that we did an investigation on um, Cashew. We did a, an analysis and presented it to him. We went to a place called Rongis in France. It's like there is a huge, gigantic market. And we saw cashew nuts being sold at about $12, $12 per kilo. We traced it because under their law, there must be traceability. It was traced to Vietnam. Vietnam imported it from Nigeria. The Nigerian who exported it got $2 per kilo. All the Vietnamese did was to roast it in fire and add a little salt. And they were selling at $12 each. Now, that shocked him. And he now asked, what should happen now? That was when we now got in touch with the Cashew Association of Nigeria. I would say, what are your problems? Why can't you process these before you send them out? They gave us a lot of tales about how the banks don't want to listen. We carried this to the central bank. Central bank now called the bankers committee and said, this is an example of you not listening to agriculture. What I'm actually driving at with this long story is that things are beginning to happen. Remember I said at the beginning, if this question came about 10 years, eight, 10 years ago, I would say we will not go to any African free trade zone. Right now, things are beginning to happen. And like I said, listen to this part platform, the kind of quality of people speaking, and those, the questions that are coming are very intelligent questions. And it, it also tells us the fact that we have a great chance. Let me also tell you another thing that also happened. Two people we met have gone to Gabon. They go and because there is ease of doing business there. So they are now growing things in Gabon to import into Nigeria. These are Nigerians. So we now said, why don't you say, oh, the trouble here is too much. We carry this again to the government and say, this is an example. It's like what happened in Songhai. I don't know whether you know about the story of Songhai, the, the Reverend Father that came, was looking for land. He couldn't find land there. He went to the Republic of Benin. Now Nigerians are flocking to the Republic of Benin to be trained in the arts of these are these are happening and i believe that uh, they can only continue to, to to improve the private sector is now taking its role and younger people better educated people it people i assure you uh, i'm sorry to say that if in 10 years ago we were having this kind of conversation uh, the youngest person we will have on this platform will be 60 or 65 but look at the quality of the people we're having now and the level of their knowledge. This can only go forward. So I'm saying uh, Africa Free Trade Zone, we are ready. Bring it on. Uh, thank you, Emmanuel. If you allow me to poke you a little bit on that, Please. on the issue with the cashew, it took yes. the network to uh, reach out to the central bank and get them faced with a challenge yes. for a solution to come up. Yes. What, is, what are those phone calls and those uh, institutions that, for an SME that does not, uh, is not prominent in Nigeria, what are those quick phone calls that they should be making, right, for, now, for these things whatever, to be addressed? Whatever it is you are involved in, form an association. Join the association. The associations are members of Nigeria Agri Business Group. Whatever it is you cannot handle on your own, bring it to us because we have a quarterly meeting with the vice president of Nigeria, who is the head of the economic team. So that is the situation. Form an association. If you cannot form an association, talk to us. We'll take it on board. It's our duty at Nigeria Agri Business Group to carry this to government. And government is beginning to listen because the ground has been softened with the price of oil. Awesome. Absolutely useful, uh, Emmanuel. So for everyone on the panel, I think it is clear about how you could leverage or use the Nigerian Agribusiness Group as a channel uh, to hopefully address some of those issues. I, I do have one more uh, question that hopefully we can address before we close this panel. And there are many of them, so I'll try to combine as much as possible. So. The question is again from Tolu Lope, uh, and thanks for the, the great questions that you're raising. I think you, you mentioned that, uh, Tolu Lope mentions that he has an active database of youth-owned businesses who are interested in exporting. 
Some of them have identified some issues in packaging and branding of the products to be exported. And poor motorable roads prevent them from getting the goods from farm to civilization. Are you aware of any other incentives, you know, beyond what you've suggested, uh, Emmanuel, on uh, going through the agribusiness business group? Are there other incentives that the government is currently uh, providing to solve some of those issues? And this is open to whoever has answered to this or if you have answers, Emmanuel. The only problem is that the government would not want to advance those various incentives to, to individuals. They rather do it as a group. Uh, if, if, they, if they come, like I said, as a group and they have specific problems, then we can deal with those specific problems, but not as individuals. There are too many individuals, but there are gigantic companies too that come and those ones are big enough and we can deal with that. So I'm just simply saying that we'll make a number available, get in touch, and we'll get, we'll put, if you are not, don't belong to an association, we'll link you up with the proper association to be linked up with. We've got to do things in an organized manner, and it should not be based on who knows who. It should be based on a proper, um, open, and transparent relationship with the belief that agriculture is Nigeria's future, and everybody who has a problem must the help to get over the such problems. Those are, those are basically what I would say here. Unfortunately, this platform, I'm available to provide all the information and you can let them have it and be in touch. We have a very, very um, hardworking secretariat and we'll deal with them as they come. Um, Perfect, uh, thank you. And, and speaking to that, some people in the, uh, among the participants are definitely looking for ways to keep in touch with you. If uh, that's something you're comfortable to share, um, please go ahead and do that in the chat. No thread. problem at all. Um, and I saw you nodding, Kenneth. Uh, what would be your, your, your closing remarks on, on that aspect? Yes, I mean, I, um, I agree with what Mr. Ejiwari has said. Um, I happen to be one of those people that would go right into his office there <laughs> and um, he called me a rascal. I, I know for a fact that the Nigerian agribusiness group is that open. And um, the biggest problem with the youth is we always want to do things individually. You know, and um, we, we are at a time when um, collaboration is key. And um, we need to be able to work together to be able to unlock these opportunities. Nigeria has never been at a better time as it is now. Um, if I were to close, one of my best quotes of all times um, was um, in William Shakespeare's Julius Caesar when Brutus was speaking to Cassius and he said, um, there is a tide in the affairs of all Taking now would great, lead to great fortune, omitted and the voyage of their lives is bound in miseries. Upon such a full sea, we are now afloat and we must take each current as it serves. This is that time that we're talking about. You know, so um, there has never been a time when entrepreneurs in Nigeria have been so empowered to be able to do things together. You know, this is the time when we should be able to take the current now that it's serving. You know, this is an opportunity for us to be able to explore all the numerous benefits that comes with the CFTA. This is the time for us to be able to drag Mr. Idiwari by the ear respectfully <laughs> and, ask, <laughs> and ask for solutions on how we are able to move forward you know, and I think that we have um, the ears of the government, we have the ears of um, senior citizens like Mr. Emmanuel Ijewe, and it's for us to be able to take advantage now while it still serves hot. This, uh, taking great note of your quote, Kenneth, and uh, I could not, we could not end this uh, webinar today without hearing any closing thought from you, Umi, and in particular, as you are in a global alliance, when you think about trade, it is even more critical, uh, especially with the elements that you put forward in terms of opportunities to increase uh, trade in the continent. So maybe the closing question of which I love to hear you, Umi, is what is that big crazy idea that <laughs> Maybe you haven't felt comfortable to say so far on this panel or um, in the places where you serve. But what is that big crazy idea that can really set Nigeria apart uh, to take, you know, to, to embrace the AFCTA uh, in 
as soon as implementation happens, what, what is that thing that you think will really kept Niger keep Nigeria ahead of the curve? Well, I think that that's a, that, that's a hard question to answer, to be honest with you. Uh, I don't particularly know of any crazy idea. If, if I do, I probably would be somewhere else right now trying to, trying to either trade market or do something about it. But I, I guess my only thing here is that um, CFTA gives us this opportunity to, to do things a bit differently, um, to really determine where we want to play um, in the value chain. We've talked about where we've been with a lot of our Western partners. And I think that Nigeria has the opportunity to do it differently. Um, I think the one, we are at an advantage from a people perspective. We are at an advantage from a, a skills perspective. Um, the, the, the sheer amount of creative Nigerian groups um, running around um, is, is impressive. Um, we are at, at an advantage even from a capital perspective. Um, I've been to, I've, I've had the opportunity to be, to, to visit different countries um, in Africa. And we have such strong uh, presence in your banking system. So we, we have capital even on our side. And for me, that one crazy idea is that we start to innovate for Africa. Um, we need to understand who the African market is. Um, we need to innovate for them accordingly. And then we, we just need to, 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 to become ready. So in my, in my opinion, it's this roadmap to readiness that allows us to take advantage of, of this agreement uh, to the fullest form. And though the roadmap includes really um, just fixing what needs to be fixed in-house. So the, the inefficiencies at the, at the border level, um, over the, the documentation challenges that we're facing, the security issues, that are brewing in the north. Um, so the things that we need to tidy up at this point. But ultimately, we need to innovate for Africa. Um, and, and Nigeria has that potential to do that, create new products and new solutions that that we can export um, through through this through this agreement. Um, and I, I think that it is positive, and I want to end up in that positive note that it, it is quite positive what the future holds for this country. And I don't just say that as a Nigerian, but an optimistic Nigerian, but I actually do believe that we could, we could make good use of, of this opportunity. So why not? Thank you. Uh, thank you for that great note, uh, Bumi. And I think you've spoken to things that are relevant for sure, not just for Nigeria, but also for people from other countries that might be in this uh, webinar today or who listen to this afterwards. I think there are some important things that we're taking away from the webinar today. So I'm going to summarize those quickly, knowing that not everyone joined from the beginning. Uh, the key things, it seems like the time is ripe to, for Nigeria to embrace the AFCTA. And so it is for other countries in the region. Uh, further, for Nigeria, there's opportunity to take advantage from the people, skills, capital uh, that allows Nigeria to innovate and stay ahead of the curve. And specifically for small businesses, it's the three things stand out as critical. Leverage the, the right networks go in, in a group approach to raise the issues faced by businesses that can really accelerate the favorable policies needed to take advantage of the opportunities that the AFCTA presents. And further, it is not just about expanding into uh, across the continent for Nigeria, it is actually a forcing mechanisms to increase our efficiency and therefore earning more foreign reserves because we can export more, but actually because we're more efficient, we can suddenly solve more of the problems that we're facing at home with food security. Uh, on that note, I'd like to really thank our lovely panelists today. It's been quite insight, insightful and I've learned some things myself, hoping the um, people in the, uh, in the more participants today did take away some useful things as well. I will, close it off here and hand over back to Louise 
uh, for closing this webinar. I know Uche, unfortunately, we were not able to hear your closing remarks, but did definitely take away some important aspects that uh, are relevant for businesses that participated today. Thank you. And over to you, Louise. Thank you, Rude. I just want to say a massive thank you to our panel, uh, despite some connectivity issues. Um, very, very interesting. Um, so thank you all so much for your time. And to our attendees, thank you so much. And we hope to see you next time. Take care and we'll see you soon.